Folks, many of you know him as Jack Donahue, the ruthless king of one-liners on 30 Rock, or as the guy who has hosted SNL a record 17 times, or as the guy who does Trump better than Trump himself. Alec Baldwin is being honored with an all-star comedy tribute called One Night Only on Spike. It's Alec Baldwin, you know, coffee is for closers and Beetlejuice's nemesis and the very first Jack Ryan. Let's face it, folks, Alec Baldwin is a guy who loves to dish it out, but now it is his turn to take it. When he and his friends hit the stage for an all-star comedy tribute, One Night Only with Alec Baldwin, premieres Sunday, July 9th at 9 on Spike. Also, I want to let you know about something cool. You heard me talk about going to see some great jazz recently, and I just found out about this not-for-profit arts organization called Jazz Reach. It's dedicated to the promotion, performance, teaching, and creation of jazz music and is the nation's leading provider of live educational jazz programming on the subject. Jazz Reach presents more than 50 educational performances in numerous clinics, master classes, lecture demonstrations, and main stage concerts every year. If you want to learn more or donate, go to Jazz Reach. Reach.org. The arts are important, so go help out, will ya? That's jazzreach.org. All right, let's do the show. The All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuck sticks? Uh, what the fuck nicks? How are you? What's happening? My name is Mark Marin. This is WTF, my podcast. Nice to have you. Today on the show, I will be talking to Sophia Coppola, which is very exciting, because I enjoyed her new movie, uh, The Beguiled, very much, and I've, I've liked almost all of her movies. Why not just say all of them? Why not be diplomatic, Mark? Well, to be honest, I haven't seen one of them, all right? But I've seen the other ones that I saw, I liked. There's no reason to assume that I wouldn't like the other one. But this one was pretty beautiful and pretty challenging in a good way, and... uh and, and kind of amazing, because it, it forced me to go watch the original, which I believe I'd seen at some point in my life. It would be hard to imagine forgetting that film, but I think maybe it was one of those films that I never saw in its entirety, but only saw parts of. The original Beguiled, uh, I, I believe it was shot by, was it Don Siegel in the early 70s? Same guy did Dirty Harry with Clint Eastwood. Anyways, I'll look it up and, and talk to you about it in a minute. Uh, and, uh, and about other things. But uh, I did want to share this email right out of the gate. It just says in the subject line, just want to say thanks. Mark, after years of your promos, I've recently, finally, subscribed to Stitcher Premium to get access to your back catalog. Why did I wait? I've forgotten how good some of these are. The hour with Patrice O'Neill is life-changing. The perspective I have now on episodes with folks like Jimmy Fallon or Brian Cranston makes them all the more fascinating. You've been a big part of my life now for almost a decade. Listening to these back apps is like looking at an old photo album. Hearing the whole intro, hearing you speak of Boomer in the present tense, hearing you rant about various romantic interests you had at that moment, it's all great. Feel free to use this as a testimonial in any advertising you wish. I'd be flattered. And thanks again for the laughs, the tears, and the twice-weekly dose of sanity. Love you, brother, Dan. Well, Dan, it just so happens that that fits right into me telling people, yesterday we posted an episode of the new podcast miniseries Classic Showbiz with Cliff Nesteroff. Go check it out. And if you want to hear more, more of those or any of the stuff I just talked about, you can get it on Howl or the new Stitcher Premium service. That's the whole damn shebang. The whole WTF catalog. All there. But the uh, classic showbiz stuff is great. Pow! Look out. I just shit my pants. Just coffee.coop. That's a classic style ad from the old days of WTF. I'm actually not even drinking uh, just coffee. I'm drinking some uh, chicory coffee uh, out of a mug that is uh, the type that they have in uh, diners. Some people use them for promotional mugs, but they're a very specific type of mug. None of this matters. None of it matters. I got a mug from Stephen Colbert. Holy shit. The swag in the dressing room at the Colbert show is a a bit beyond. Just, you walk in, it's like there might as well be a fucking Christmas tree in there. There was all kinds of shit. There was cheese that you could eat right there. Nice sort of uh, artisanal cheese with a baguette and crackers. There was uh, products from Lush that uh, healthy manufacturer of giant balls that you drop in the tub and bubble. There was all kinds of, there was some, there was some uh, socks 
There was the, the mug, there was a t-shirt, there was like a bunch of different cakes and cookies and shit. Man, by the time I got done with Colbert, I was like, I, I was in a sugar coma. So, that being said, that I was there, it was interesting. You know, I did the Today Show, uh, which I've done before with, uh, with Al Roker. My old, uh, co, most guest appearances on Conan, uh, guy. We were the go-tos back in the day, me and Roker. They had a guest fall out when they were in New York. They'd give us a call. What do you got, Marin? Got anything? Got any half-done jokes that could find themselves as you chat to Conan? I do. Bring me in. But uh, the Today Show was fun. I did that with Allison and uh, Betty Gilpin. And then I did a bunch of serious shows over on Sirius. Uh, I did uh, Bill Carter's show. I did Jimmy Norton's show. I did the Entertainment Weekly show. I did a little thing for their new Beatles channel. And then uh, I had uh, I had uh, lunch at Alex Guarnicelli's restaurant. Butter. Guys, I'm just... Free plug day. I'm just trying to walk you through my day in New York. It was just nearby, and fuck, it was good. She wasn't there, though. I texted her. She was, uh, you know, at a benefit of some kind. I love her. I love her cooking. That's that's uh, that's all I'm going to say on that. But then the exciting thing, though, was I'd never done the Colbert show since he's been there. Uh, I'd never done any of his shows. I'd been on Letterman a few times, but I'd never done Stephen's show. And I've never really interviewed Stephen on this show. But I was excited to do his show because, you know, he's getting the hang of it and he's a, he's a very talented guy and he's a very sweet man, Mr. Colbert. And I've always felt that from way back in the day. We knew each other, uh, a bit way back in the day. And I talked about it on my appearance on the Colbert show. Well, he brought it up, but we used to work next door to each other in an office back in 93, 94. He was in Exit 57. I was hosting Short Attention Span Theater. And he was always a very grounded, uh, kind of almost clean-cut fella. But the thing that was exciting about going back to the Ed Sullivan Theater for uh, the uh, Late Show with Stephen Colbert is that, as I said, I'd been there before. Letterman, obviously, was a big part of my life. And I love David Letterman. I always was more than honored to do the David Letterman show. But this was going to that theater... And and doing a show that is hosted by a contemporary of mine, someone around my age, someone uh, who came up with me at the same time. We not together, but we were you know chipping away at show business at the same time. He arguably was a lot more present, and you knew him a lot better than me. But it, it was just kind of fascinating that we're a couple of middle aged guys who started out in roughly the same hallway in a way in television. I believe we started out. Next to each other, you know, with all, with a, almost practically adjoining offices. So I was sort of happy and proud of him and, and excited to be there because we're contemporaries and he's driving the big ship. He's driving the big theater. He's driving the Ed Sullivan theater. And that's a, that's no, that's a heavy legacy, man. And Stephen was great. It was great to see him. And I think we worked well together. I don't know. You know, I've had an opportunity to build relationships with, you know, with Conan. Uh, a bit with Letterman, and this is the first time I've done his talk show, and it, it is a very specific thing to do a talk show segment, a panel segment, and I and I think we did good. I think we both had a good time, and I think it went well, feeling each other out on the stage at the Ed Sullivan Theater. So if you didn't see that, you can go watch that now. I was there to uh, to promote Glow, and it just so happens we're sponsored today by Netflix, and what's premiering on Netflix tomorrow? That's right. It's finally time for Glow, the show you've been hearing me talk about for months. It's the story of the first all-female wrestling league from the 1980s, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. Oh man, I can't wait. It's it's happening. People are loving it. I mean, I and I look. I you know I don't want to. I'm not toot my own horn. I'm very happy for everybody involved. But the the reviews for it have been amazing. It's from the team that brought you Orange Is the New Black. That's executive producer Jen G. Cohen, and the creators are Liz Flayhive and Carly Mensch. Check it out. Not just for me, but for my great co-stars Allison Brie, Betty Gilpin, and everyone else in the cast. There's another 12 of them. And I'll have more WTF episodes coming up with people from Glow, Genji Cohen, Kia Stevens, Chavo Guerrero, the showrunners, and the writing staff. All episodes of Glow are streaming tomorrow, Friday, June 23rd, only on Netflix. Well, it's exciting. I, you know, I, I hope it gets out. You know, we're constantly on uh, end of the world watch, so I'm checking my phone. I, 
I'd like it if the world didn't end before Globe premieres. Is that selfish? Is that self-centered? I'd like the missiles to not fly at all, but you know, hopefully until after Friday. Give give people a week to watch Globe. Could you do that, Mr. President? So Sophia Coppola is here, and the beguiled man. This like I actually her new film. I uh, I watched twice, and I watched it twice in a theater actually. So I saw it the way you're supposed to see it. I watched it. I went to a screener and watched it. And then I went to a, a little premiere thing that uh, Sophia spoke at at Quentin Tarantino's theater, the New Beverly, and they ran it back to back with the original Beguiled. Now the original, like it was interesting for me to watch the original because I watched Sophia's first, and then I watched the original before I talked to her. And the original is a menacing, macabre, uh, Southern Gothic. I would almost call it a horror story. And the new one. It's different. It, it is the same story, but it's, it's, it's approached very differently. Um, there are elements for, she went back and found the book. I talked to her about that. But, uh, you know, as far as what she drew from the original movie, which is a Don Siegel film, Clint Eastwood's in it, Geraldine Page is in it, and it's really against character for, uh, for old Clint. I don't know, I, maybe this is either just before or just after, uh, Dirty Harry. Maybe it was, um, shooting almost simultaneously, it seemed. But it was before Clint had a certain angle. And, and right at the beginning of The Beguiled in the Clint Eastwood version, the Don Siegel version, you know he's uh, just a, sh- a shitty man. Just like... And it just gets weirder and weirder with all the, the effects and uh, psycho weirdness from the 70s cinema you know, everything is just loaded, and it's in the South. The, the story is about a, a Union soldier who is injured and, you know, stumbles upon a little girl picking mushrooms and is taken in at this uh, small girl's school. Most of the girls are gone, but there's a few there. And right from the get-go in the Siegel version, it's menacing from all levels, and all the characters are a bit fucked up. But in Sophia's, there's a, a beautiful kind of poetic feel to it there's a a lyrical vibe to it it's all the camera work is all handled beautifully it was shot in new orleans and colin farrell plays the union soldier but you don't know what to do with him from the beginning obviously the situation is loaded uh when a soldier is taken in by a girl's school with the women from all ages present and you don't know what's going to happen or how it's going to go, but uh, if you've seen the original, you've got a, somewhat of an idea. But I wouldn't uh, judge, you know, don't don't go into the new one thinking that you know what's going to happen because the way that Sophia worked with this script and worked with this story was, you know, not until way into it do you really judge this dude, and it's kind of fascinating because how you judge him as a man or a woman is on you. You know, and wh- how you judge what happens is on you, and it will tell you interesting things about yourself. As I told her, like, I thought about the, the movie for weeks in terms of that male character. So I, I, I dug it a lot. I really did. And you know what? I've got an idea for you this weekend. When you're sitting down to watch some TV, maybe binging Glow on Netflix, make sure you listen to how it sounds. Because if it's not the most dynamic movie theater style sound imaginable, that means you're not listening on Playbase by Sonos. And then run out and get yourself a Playbase so you can make the most out of what you're watching. I hooked mine up in minutes, and now I have theater-quality sound coming from my TV. Playbase also plays my music when I'm not using it for the TV. It has a low-profile design, which means it pretty much disappears beneath your television. You'll barely know it's there, people, until you hear it in action when it gives you epic home theater sound. From movies and sports to TV shows and gaming, Playbase adds pulse-pounding sound to whatever's playing on your TV. Plus, it was created for TVs that sit on stands and furniture. No wall mount required. In fact, one power cord and one optical cord is all it takes. The Sonos app guides you through every step of the setup, and it works with almost all TV, cable box, and universal remotes, so no need to go out and get more remotes. Everything sounds better on Playbase. See for yourself and go to Sonos.com to learn more. That's S-O-N-O-S dot com. All right? All right. And I, I highly recommend The Beguiled, I, uh, both of them. But, you know, Sofia Coppola's film is pretty great. 
And I like all her movies. I actually, you know, they screened at the New Beverly. Uh, she, she announced the film. She brought the, they, you know, Quentin talked her into screening, um, some 1998 short film she did. And God, how old was she in 1998? I don't know. Let's do some math. Born in 71, 81, 91. So she was like 27, 26, 27. But it was her first film. It was a short film. And that was pretty cute, pretty good. And a little dark. You saw the themes already. Virgin Suicides, great, great movie. Lost in Translation. Loved that movie. How could you not love that movie? Marie Antoinette also liked it. Uh, Somewhere, I also liked with the Stephen Dorff fella. I didn't see the bling ring. Did not see it. But, I've always respected her. She's got a unique vision, and she's uh, committed to it, and she's got a great eye and a great sense of story, and she picks great actors. And uh, I think she's a, a, a wonderful director, and I was thrilled to talk to her. Whew. It's hot in here, man. I'm starting to sweat. So The Beguiled opens in theaters tomorrow, Friday, June 23rd. Uh, and now this is me and uh, Sophia Coppola talking here in the garage. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. I didn't know if I would be able to hear you, but I can. I'll try to project. Not mumble, yeah. <laughs> Are you a mumbler? I am. Really? I texted your your cousin's been in here, Jason. Jason? Oh. Yeah. yeah. I, we're not. He's doing a show today with Phoenix is visiting him. My husband's been there going to do Jason's show today. <laughs> oh, so you came with the whole family to um, L.A. Just, or just just him. He's that. on tour and and. And they did the music for my movie. They did? Yeah. The, oh, oh, so they could... They did the score, but it's it's different than No, it's definitely different. I, like, I watched a movie. I watched your movie. I guess we can talk about the movie right out of the gate. You're used to that now. <laughs> You've been doing the junket thing, huh? <laughs> Sitting in a room? Yeah. Doing six-minute interviews with 25 people? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a little... Yeah, I've been talking about myself way too much. <laughs> really? You don't like it? <laughs> who, was it? who was doing the junket with you? Who was sitting there with you? Um, Kirsten and Al have been doing it with me. Kirsten Dunn, uh-huh. Al Kenny, so that's fun. But most, mostly, it's on my on my own. And you just, uh, it's. <laughs> I just did one for the show I'm in, and it's like it, it's tedious because you can't. At, at some point, your brain wants to uh, lock into something you can say to everybody, but then you know if you just say the same thing to everybody, it's going to be the same article. But then on a deeper level, you know who's going to read all the articles. Yeah, that's true. I just try to do autopilot. You do. Uh, but then I just get bored with hearing myself say the same. Thing. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so you've been in. But I won't. I won't. What? I won't be an autopilot this morning. I I I, I won't tolerate it. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> it, won't, it won't happen. Mm-hmm. When when was the last time? Well, we can like talk about life before. So you don't. You lived here at, at one point, no, in L.A. or never. In the nineties, I went to Cal Arts. I came. Right. I grew up in Northern California, and then in, I moved to L.A. Northern California. Our, yeah, I grew up in Napa Valley. With the with the whole clan up there in the big house, uh, with my parents and my brother, yeah, and and on our winery, <laughs> yeah, yeah, with but chickens and it, right. So you grew up in a farm almost, yeah, and and uh, but it's out in Napa Valley, mm-hmm. and yeah, Rutherford, California, yeah. and uh, they're still up there. Yeah, my parents live there. The same house. Yeah, the same house I grew up in at their winery. Well, that's nice, right? Yeah, it's really nice to be able to go up there, and I, I, I see friends that I went to first grade with. And, They're still there. Yeah, Everyone's yeah. still around. Yeah, a lot of them are. So you had kind of a, a, a relatively normal life growing up in terms of like at least being in the same place. Yeah, people are always su- surprised that I had chicken. You know, grew up near chickens and a country girl. What other animals are on the uh, the uh, the farm? There's a cow, but he's more of a pet cow. Do you eat the yeah. eggs from the chickens? Yes, we do. And so you have a lot of chickens, and then part of your life at some point was going out and getting the eggs. Um, yeah. You did it? Yeah. Occasionally? I mean, not regularly, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Once or twice. <laughs> Sounds like Marie Antoinette now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but no, I yeah, I grew up in the country. But we, we traveled a lot when um, my dad would go on location for films. We always went, we went with, with them. them. Like, what was the earliest memory do you have of going on location? Um, I lived in the Philippines during Apocalypse Now when I was... Four and five, so that was. He dragged uh, you all there. Uh, yeah, I thought it was fun. Well, yeah. yeah, we were like in helicopters in the yeah. jungle. And I probably had the best time of the whole group because they had a lot of stress with that. I know. I saw the documentary. It yeah. did not look like a, a good time for your folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so and then like uh, all right, so that was after the uh, the Godfather, anyways. But you'd always go, you know, uh, wherever he was working. If you were, you know. Yeah, he always took us with him. So I would go to. Yeah, I lived in. 
Tulsa, Oklahoma. I went to, I would, I would go to the local schools wherever we went, so. What was in Tulsa? Uh, what shot there? Uh, Rumblefish and the Outsiders. That was shot in Oklahoma? Yeah, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I used to, yeah. I loved that movie. Yeah, I'm Rumblefish. Too. I love Rumblefish. It's one of my favorites. Mine too. It's a weird thing. There was a period there where I was seeing it like once a year. Oh, really? Yeah, I had to. It was just like something I needed to do. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was always my favorite of my dad's movies growing up, and then I started to appreciate The other <laughs> ones? Why do you think that one was? Just because it was so, like, the colors, and it was a little more... It, I think it, it was made for kids. It, I like it, was, it was an art movie for right. teenagers, which yeah, yeah. I, think, I think is so cool. Not There aren't that many of them. That's true. Certainly not them. I guess there aren't really any in general. Yeah, it always, it always bugged me growing up that the movies made for teenagers always were, didn't look that high quality. Right, they were just, uh, you know, dumb comedies, but, you know, some of those had a big impact on I us. Love, I love John Hughes. Movies. Right, that's yeah. what I was thinking of, yeah. exactly. But, like, there were movies like, I guess, Baz Luhrmann, when mm-hmm. he did Romeo and Juliet, that was some sort of weird attempt yeah. at uh, elevating the form for yeah, the youth. that's true. I right? always appreciate when people do that, because a lot of times I thought, why do they have to have bad cinematography and bad lighting? Like, well, yeah, that was kind of a spectacle. What was the other one he did? Uh, I can't remember, but, like, mm-hmm. Marie Antoinette sort of was uh, trying to do a little of that, right, to connect with younger people? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what my thinking was. <laughs> yes, it was. It was definitely in a teenage girl feeling. Because she was a teenage girl, kind of, right. Right? right? Yeah. And I liked it. That was a, that must have been a, a fun movie to do. It was really fun. I couldn't believe that they <laughs> opened up the Chateau Versailles how'd for that, us. How'd you get that? To, how'd you get that done? I, I imagine people have tried over the years. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. We met them, and they were they were very open to it. And I guess they liked Lost in Translation, and they said they would let us film there. And then we pulled up all our trucks in front of the castle. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. The first day we By were the shooting fountain? there, right in the front. Yeah. And um and then we I remember we were shooting in the um Hall of Mirrors and all of our equipment was in the room next to it and it was like her Marie Antoinette's real bedroom was right. where all our equipment cases were. I it was so <laughs> surreal. And Jason who played Yeah. Uh, King Louis, we did a Cribs episode. We shot him giving a tour of Versailles. It was, it was really exciting that they, it felt like they let the kids in to yeah. make a movie. Did you use that as promo? I don't remember seeing the Cribs episode. I don't know where it is. I have to find it. I think we put it out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of funny. You live in Paris now? I live more in New York, but we, um, I moved, I stayed in Paris after Marie Antoinette, and then, um, after a couple of years, came back to New York. Yeah. To- How's New York doing? Oh, good. I live in the West Village. And That's nice, right? Yeah. And but you but you, you spent a lot of time in San Francisco because I was there for a couple of years. Your dad's yeah. office is in San Francisco, right? Yeah, in North Beach. Right. I, I never really lived in San Francisco. I mean, as a little kid, but then we moved up to Napa when I was. But five. was that your city for a while? I mean, did you? That's where I'd go see bands. I mean, luckily, um, we could go see bands in San Francisco. And did, did you? Were you part of the the scene there at all, or you just go see bands? Like no, I was I was living up in Napa, but I would just go in and see bands. Yeah. I never lived there as an adult. No. It's a good city, though, right? It's kind of yeah. weird. I never understand what's going on there. I lived there for a couple of years, and I like most cities, you can sort of get a handle on the at least the economic dynamics or just the, what the tone of the city is. But there, I'm like, what is going on here? Yeah, I never figured it out either. Doesn't your yeah. brain try to do that, though, a little yeah. bit? Yeah, it is always kind of a mystery, that place. My brother lives there now, but there is such a, a mix of... Yeah, you just don't like, for, before the tech thing, I was like, where's the money coming from? What's the history of this place? And I guess it's available information, but there was always such a profound freak element, you know, in a proud way, yeah. that there, there there was this kind of like something untethered about it. You'd work, you'd walk around certain parts of San Francisco and you're like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the old guard society right. thing from another era that's still hanging on. And what, but what, who were they though? I don't like, know. like, are they cowboys? Were they gold prospectors? I mean, it's always been sort of a, a, a kind of a, a magnet for, all types of American weirdness. Yeah, out- outsiders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, I don't know, like, I still don't know because I'm like, not as compulsive as I should be in learning things. Like, what settled that city? And I know, I must be the, it must be the boats. Must be things coming in. Yeah, the must trade. be the port. Yeah, yeah. the trade. And I like that we're speculating over known things. One of my favorite things to do. <laughs> but then I like that my dad in the 70s, we so were going to leave Hollywood and went up yeah. there and then George Lucas and then it became a, Kind of a hippie. Film, oh yeah, film yeah, somewhere right. Too. Yeah, yeah. What was that like in the early seventies? Yeah, yeah. So how is your dad? He's good. Yeah. Is it all about the wine now, pretty much? Yeah, but he's still. He just wrote a book about um, electronic cinema and his ideas of film. So he's still interested in that. But he's 
yeah, he's making wine. Yeah. Into it. And how long was it before? Like, I, I know that, um, you know, it, you, you didn't set out initially to be a director. You kind of like did other stuff. It was, was that kind of a part of a resistance to the family business or did you just like <laughs> want to do your own thing? Like, I mean, how long did it take for you to come around to be like, no, I'm going to direct? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> it seems so obvious, but at the time I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I, I went to Cal Arts and I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a painter. Really? Did you and, paint? Yeah, but very badly. Uh, uh, yeah. And then, um, and then I went to Art Center. I moved to Art Center. And, Where's uh, Art Center? In Pasadena. Right here? Yeah. Oh, that's a pretty famous place. Yeah. Yeah. And then my painting teacher told me I, I wasn't a painter. Oh. And I was really upset, but I'm, I'm glad that they did. And, yeah. I, and I met um, Paul Jasmine, the photography teacher there, and got into photography. And um, Really? Like, you got? did you get into the history of photography and everything, or just shooting? Just shooting, and, and again, yeah, in the history, but more contemporary. And, right. And I collect photographs. You and, do? And, um, yeah, and, I, and so I, I love photography, and that's... Um, how I got into film through photography. Oh, yeah, you can definitely see that in your films. Like, who were, like, some of the photographers that, like, you know, inspired Um, you? I love Eggleston and Lee Freelander and um, uh, Helmut Newton. Did you go far back? Like, you know, because, like, did you ever look at that Age stuff? No, I was always more interested in more contemporary or, you know, 40s on. Yeah. Um, And, um, I but I... I wasn't like consciously deciding not to go into the film business. Maybe I was rebelling. Yeah, but, a little. Um, but um, you would have had to lose your last name to completely rebel. You'd have to. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> my my ten year old daughter is really into gymnastics, and she said, "I'm going to be the first athlete in our family." They're all artists. And oh, really? That's funny. That's but, how she's going to find. Yeah. yeah. Look, that's better than drinking and being. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> we'll see. Like, if she's going to like, hey, fuck you, I'm going to do gymnastics. <laughs> You're doing good as yeah. a parent. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I hope we can keep it up. Did but, you ever do like a, a show of your photographs and stuff? Were you like really um, pursuing it? Or? No, I worked for like ma- magazines, and I did. I did a, sh- a group show in Tokyo with some other people, but um, but I was doing more kind of portraits and fashion. Never like an art photographer, but I don't know how I ended up. I I was in my twenties, yeah. just trying to figure it out and doing different things. Um, but I was always kind of frustrated that I had a lot of interest, but I didn't wasn't an expert at any and then I made a, a short film. I had a, a little clothing company doing t shirts and I was interested in different things and trying to figure out I didn't want to wake up one day and say, Oh, I wish I had done something so I tried to try a lot of things. You did some T shirts? Is it how's that yeah. how's that line doing? Is it still Oh around? it's gone. No, <laughs> no. It was a early nineties <laughs> moment. Did it did but, it did it pick up any traction? Um it did well in Japan and oh, then, really? you know, we left it there. So, yeah, like California T shirts. But um no we had like a little fashion Line. But I tried different things, and then I made a short film, and um, uh, and I thought, oh, here's something that incorporates all the things I'm I'm into in music and photography, and and you had to realize that on your own, you couldn't, you know, look at it, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like and it, it seems so obvious, but it never occurred to me. I never thought I would be a director. It's so. like, it, but it's kind of kind of nice that, like, you know, it would have been expected that you would have appreciated all that before because you grew up in it and you were living it. But then, yeah. and not until you made your own thing, you're like, oh, you put music and, and it was acting. And I was, <laughs> yeah, I, I was surprised at how I knew how to do it because I didn't go to film school, but. Of course, I spent my whole life on my dad's sets, and he was always talking about it. And we were, you know, with all these great yeah. people that he worked with. But um, he was he constantly talking about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was, and and right and about writing too. I mean, as a, a little kid, he'd be talking about like three act structure. Sure. And, you know, so I I was learning all all this. All it was time. all absorbing. And I guess if you're yeah. on set wandering around the Philippines watching him direct that movie, you're like, well, maybe I don't have to go that far. Maybe <laughs> keep, keep it a little tighter. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I got my my ten thousand hours. Yeah, didn't you do it right just by absorbing it as a child? Yeah, that's hilarious. Didn't you? Did you do like? Did you do television? You didn't do much television. No, no, I never have. Never at all. Oh, oh no, I did do it in the nineties. I had it. Um, my friends and I did it four episodes of a, a magazine show called High Octane, where we drove around in muscle cars and interviewed different people. Did it? Did it stick? No, we just did four of them, and then for who? Just, um, strangely, Comedy Central, but it wasn't really a comedy show. It was a magazine right. show, but um, I think it was. So you're driving yeah. around in big cars, talking to celebrities. Yeah, talking about like different, you know, artists and people that interested us. Who worked uh, with you on that? Um, I just did it with some of my friends. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I forgot about that. It was long ago. But I, um, but I guess the way I really got into film was I read this book, The Virgin Suicides, by Jeffy Genetes. 
and I heard they were going to make a film of it, and I felt really protective of. I hope I hope they don't mess it up when you have a book that you love, and so I started trying to figure out how I would write a script to it, and I didn't I didn't have the rights to it; someone else did. But I I wrote the script yeah. as an experiment, and then I felt so attached to it that I found the producers and I asked them to read my script, and and somehow they let me. And they let you direct it, it? Yeah. And they use your script? <laughs> yeah, I got to, they read my script and, and. What's it, like, it's a, it's a intense movie. Like, what was it that compelled you, like, really? Is it just the story or just because it, 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 it's, it's, it's dark but has other elements? I mean. I love the book. I, I love the way it was written yeah. and, the, and the mystery between the boys trying to understand girls and just that age and, and kind of the, the melancholy of being that age. And yeah. I just feel like he really captured the, the feeling of yeah, that in a very extreme situation yeah and it's sober, <laughs> and, yeah but there's something like romantic about it i think when you're that age especially like the idea of love and death it's all kind of heightened right but you don't actually follow through with it generally no <laughs> <laughs> that, that's no, the difference all, you take it to yeah. a limit and then yeah you can you can kind of exercise all that in in a story and not have not have to do anything that drastic well i think those dynamics are like the, those kind of happen through all the movies right really that you've done that the the weird trying to understand men and women, right? Yeah, I think there's always a, a mystery in that, or something interesting. Like, yeah. we can talk about Lost in Translation, because that does it, too. I mean, that, uh, outside of being about, you know, men and women to a degree, they're also kind of meditations on celebrity, in a way, right? Yeah, I'm always drawn to some element of that, probably just growing up around uh, having a famous father and people reacted or something i don't know why but th- there's something i mean so in our culture yeah it is but like your sensitivity to it's going to be different you yeah know, because you like it was just i imagine that dinners at your house in napa on some nights you were like you know what the fuck is happening <laughs> look at who are all these pe- these people are like really famous and geniuses i don't know if i i think i just you didn't register just, it they were just people they were just like the people that my dad worked with and <laughs> But I mean, in retrospect, don't you think back and go like, "Holy shit!" I was like, yeah, there's some. I was there's seven. Some funny stories, yeah. Like what? Oh, I don't know the people that came through their house. There were definitely a lot of characters. Yeah. And um, I don't know we were talking about Richard Gere the other yeah. day, and I remember being, you know, like ten, and he was like skinny dipping in our pool, or oh, you know, like, it's appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They, did he he did a lot of work at the house like he would have readings and stuff there or what or just yeah yeah when they would have yeah the actors would do readings right, right. He, he would always make dinner for lots of people he likes yeah. to cook huh yeah he has he he can just like throw together a big dinner for all these people like no problem which i is a mystery to me it seems very important to him yeah it's the, the italian family right. thing did making that, people feel did you get any of that um i have the same you know wanting to you know, on set to make everyone right. feel like family and comfortable, right. but I can't make dinner at the last minute for right, twenty just people. Whip up a, a pot of uh, pasta <laughs> no, and sauce. I wish I feel I, it's too much pressure being Italian and not being able to do that well. So <laughs> I ask him, "How do you do that?" And he's like, "You just feel it." And I was like, "I don't feel it. Tell me exactly how you do it." <laughs> you just feel it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess, I, I don't know, I think that's nice. I think it's a nice thing to be able to entertain a bunch of people spontaneously and uh, having that be a, a lovely thing. Yes, and not a stressful Yeah, yeah, disaster. like, oh my God, they're coming. Do we have everything? What's it? Right, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a nice environment to grow up in. Yeah. So what I did, which like I, it was surprising to me, because I went and saw Your Beguiled, and then I felt compelled to watch the original yesterday, which is much more disturbing. Yeah. And I, I feel like I've seen it before in my life. Like, I don't remember, like, because uh, when I realized it was a remake and, and I saw it was in I think I saw bits and pieces of it flipping On through. On TV right. or something, yeah. But I've seen a lot of Don Siegel's movies. I've certainly seen most of Clint Eastwood's movies. But I, I don't think I saw that one, which is this weird outlier, really. It, it, it's it's another a, art film. <laughs> it's definitely like a 70s art film, but it's also like, you know, kind of off-brand for Clint, at, I would imagine, at that time. Yeah. Right? Th- yeah, very much so. And it, it, it was it was surprising. It was surprising to watch it for the first time coming out of your film because something about that movie. I mean, when and I imagine you've been asked this before, but what was it that made you decide to do that movie? Yeah, I I had never seen the film. People that really know movies, it's a classic in that kind of genre. But um, my friend Ann Ross, who's my production designer, yeah, she um. She said, oh, I, I just saw this movie, The Beguiled, this Don Siegel, Clint Eastwood movie. You need to see it. I think you need to remake it. And um, and I was like, oh, ha, ha. You know, I would never 
ever think of remaking someone else's movie. And then I watched it, and it just stayed in my head. It was so weird and not what I expected, and it just um, and it was so odd to me the story of these w- women in a Southern girls' school yeah. and this enemy soldier comes in and so I, I i found a book that was out of print and the, oh the actual book it was based on yeah it was based on a novel by thomas cullen and, and um so i found a copy and started looking at it and it's all written by the each chapter is a different woman's point of view of this encounter oh and the characters yeah, yeah. the characters so then i just started thinking about how i would love to make a new version that's all from their point of view and start in their world and then this you know, man, they haven't seen a man in years, and then an enemy soldier comes in, and it's all very heated, and yeah. and um, so so that was how I and and then Universal had it in their library, and I asked them if they would let me take it out and make. What does that version. mean? They had it in their library. They owned it. They owned it because they had because made the original film. And they still own it, so they still they continue to pay licenses on. Or, I, I or, think you just I think you have to buy it outright when you make oh. the film, and then it stays in your archive. Huh. So I asked them if they could take it out and dust it off and. So you had to dig up that book, and that uh, I guess that would explain the weird kind of um, subconscious voiceovers in the original, that yes. you, you have these moments. That must be right out of the book, yeah. in a way, or a way to accommodate the point of view thing. Yeah, yeah. the the, the, the Don Siegel movie has a lot of voiceover and yeah. flashbacks, right. and, and you know right away he's a bad guy, where, where I wanted to be more in the women's point of view of trying to... You know, figure out. Well, that was the thing. Is that like that was like because I left your movie. Um, I, I like your movies because like uh, they're they're provocative in a way that you know a lot of movies you watch and you get and then you kind of catalog them either as good movies or like I kind of remember that movie. But it seems that certainly the last three movies that you do that I had that you did in my memory, you kind of walk out and you you question yourself somehow and your your, your life and you know why did you have this reaction. To these, oh, this character. Cool. <laughs> well, that's good. That's what yeah. you want. Yeah, yeah. Of so, course, I'm happy people stays with them or you think about it. Well, the, the not weird, wrap it all up. Right. Well, the weird thing about about your version of the film was that it, you, you know somehow or another, like in Seagulls, you know, within two minutes, you're like, no, oh, this guy's bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's no. There's, there's no the, gray. Or, yeah. It, it, I I don't know what genre it would be in. It seems uh, it's uh, is it a, a is it a horror movie? Is it a it, what is that movie? It's a little bit more horror, but I like to just think of Southern Gothic. Southern yeah. Gothic. Oh yeah. Okay, that makes sense. But like you know, right out of the gate, you're like. Holy shit, Clint Eastwood is is not regular Clint Eastwood. Yeah, no, I don't know what I would, I'd love to know what they were talking about when they first when Don Siegel wanted to do that that movie. opening scene, or just that movie, and yeah, but yeah, what provoked it? Yeah, yeah, I'm just curious how that all came to be, but but uh, but in your film, in yeah. your version, like once the turn of events happens, yeah, and I don't know if there are spoilers with a movie that's being remade, but certainly. I, I'll treat it as such. Yeah, it's still fun if the audience doesn't know. Oh, no, like I didn't see it, and yeah. I watch a lot of movies, and if I did see it, I didn't remember it, the yeah. original. But but once the turn of events happen, I think the big difference is, is that, whether it's a point of view thing or not, is that your McBurney, uh, by Colin Farrell, is a, is a sympathetic character. Whereas Clint's is like in in no way, uh, unless you're perverse. Yeah, you uh, know he's a bad guy right from the... Get go right, but this one I feel like you're not quite sure. It's that moment of like, I, oh, I want to trust him, but I know maybe I shouldn't. Right there, yeah, but he's he, you know, he's definitely there was a weird turn in it. But like my point was yeah. is that after what happens happens, mm-hmm. you know, in you know, pretty far into the movie, really was that like the beginning of Act Three almost? Yeah, yeah, uh, you, you know, even after that happens, even that, you know, as a man, yeah. I'm sort of like, well, that's kind of understandable. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, I think it's really different whether if a man or a woman watches it, the you know, h- how you relate to it. I think it's really different. Like, you know, oddly, you know, that character and that, you know, and the power of 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 sex and violence and all this stuff that's sort of the underlying themes of this thing are 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 sort of um, eternal issues within men and women and people. Yeah, that's what I loved about the story is because we can still relate to all those Dynamics and, and then the power shift between the men, the women in the story. It's so, you know, a heightened version in the story, but 
of who's, you know, it goes back and forth with who's in charge and is he a guest or a prisoner. And I thought it was fun to get into all that. But in, in shooting it, like, cause it's, it, it's, it's very apparent and, and over explained in the original movie. So what was the challenge of, you know, dealing with the book and the script, you know, when you were constructing the thing? Yeah. I mean, I wanted you to not be clear if, more in their point of view of, you know, can we trust this guy? And, oh, he's charming. Let's, it's nice to have him around and yeah. going back and forth. And, and they're all just like, they're, they're just like wet all the time. <laughs> well, they, yeah, they, they haven't, they've been so cut off from. Right, right. And then they were like raised to be lovely ladies for men and there's no men around. And then right. he comes in and they're all, yeah, yeah, turned upside down. I love that you're like in the heat of the South and they're all repressed. And, yeah. And, and Miss Martha Nicole's character is very religious, is torn between, like, she likes to have him around, but we shouldn't really keep this enemy here. And, yeah. And so they're all um, kind of turned around. And, and and for him, it kind of starts out as, like, a fantasy that he has these ladies right. on lace pillows taking care of him. And then as it goes on, he's, you know, he's their prisoner. Kirsten Dunst's character. What's her name? Edwina. Edwina. She was great. Yeah, yeah. Your relationship with her has gone on a long time. Yeah, she was 16 when we worked together the first time. On so, Virgin Suicide? Yeah. And then you, you used her as the lead. But she seems, as she gets older, to be evolving into this, like, there's a strange depth to her that, you know, that, yeah. like, is, uh, is, it, it, there's a vulnerability, yet there's also, like, a, uh, like, a something, like a darkness. Yeah. I, would, I mean, I saw that in her when I first met her, because she looks like this kind of, pretty all-American blonde, but then there was always something deep behind her eyes, and she just is as a person, and so I think it comes out more and more, and I think she's surprising in this because it's a really quiet performance, but she conveys yeah. a lot of... I don't know, she's like the heart of the movie because she has so much vulnerability. And Farrell was really good. He can really yeah. do it when he wants to. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and I think he... Ha- I, I'm glad he has a dark side and can and right. tap into it. Yeah, pretty easily. Well. <laughs> like, how long was it... How many people did you look at for that role? I met a bunch of people, but when I met him, I had met him a long time ago, but when I met him for this, he's, he's so charismatic and charming and he's so masculine. And Elle Fanning, she, she was the 11 when I did Somewhere. Right. So it was fun to ask her to... That's now she's so long enough. ago already? Yeah. She played the daughter. She played the daughter and now she's 18, so it's, it was her first kind of, I don't know first, but it, you know, seeing her as a young woman and playing yeah. the bad girl. And, and again, in the Seagull version, you know, that girl is really bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like it, it's, it's pretty. Well, it's, it's interesting. Were you conscious of that all these characters represented some strain of, of the feminine character? Like, they're all pretty well defined. I like that they were women at different stages of, like, maturity. Right. So they're relating to him at that level of where they are at that moment. And mm-hmm. Elle's character is never, you know, she's just at that age where she's kind of coming into her sexuality and there's no men around and then he shows up and she's, um, yeah, you know, beside herself. Yeah. And she's always presenting herself as a, yeah, to, to him. And, and, um, and I love that she's just kind of, in the, in the book, that character was really self-centered and her mother raised her to like get a rich husband. So she, there's, you know, certain women that are, um, geared towards being yeah. attractive to men at all times. Right. And it's also part of that culture, I think. So, yeah, it was okay. fun to see. It's a, it's a part of culture, <laughs> in general, um, kind of. Well, I thought it's heightened in the southern, sure. southern ladies. Right, right. It was, so. it was shameless. It, yeah. It was not coded. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So she, <laughs> so she's a, a full example of, of that. And why the decision then, like, I, I imagine you had to ask certain questions because the, the, the African American, the slave yeah. in Seagulls, and I imagine in the book, was a, a, a pretty elemental part. Yeah, I mean, I felt like in the in the movie she's yeah. the side character, and I just felt like I didn't want to. It's such an important subject; I didn't want to just kind of brush over it lightly with the side character. Right. So I felt I decided not to have that character at all and just focus on the women. And a lot of the slaves had left at that time, and so they're just really cut off yeah. entirely, and they had to figure out how to live on on their own. Because like, because it seems like in in. In the original movie, there's just no relief from the menace of one character or another, right? Yeah. And and you chose to just focus on you know the ideas 
and and you know what would be the the legitimate human feelings of all these women. Yeah, and it's just really about the women and right. the man coming in and focused on that dynamic. But how much of the Nicole Kidman character in the book was you know what had all that kind of like incesty, creepy, southern, gothic? Was it in the yeah, book? Yeah, it's in the book, and I just decided to keep that out because I wanted it to be about you know, desire, and it's not, like, perverted from some incest story, and, you know, like, that it could just be that, you know, a woman has a desire that's cut off, and, and she's very religious, and there's no men around. And, and you, you just stripped it down. Yeah, yeah she didn't yeah. have to be... Geraldine Page is just, what, it, what it, like, disturbing. Inc- yeah, yeah, it's much more disturbing, that character, and, and I wanted uh, that character to be, you know, not as crazy and more attractive, and not just, like... But the woman who played Edwina was that was a, that character seems out of all of them to be pretty pretty closest closest to, to the original, right? Yeah, yeah, she was the vulnerable one, and yeah, and, and I like that about her. And then Kirsten made her version, and I also like that some of the little girls have like are the smartest ones there because they're not you know jaded by desire in a way. Yeah, I love the little girl um, Addison Ricky who plays Amy? Marie oh, who Mar- comes up with the mushroom plan. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> Like, like I like that that you know in their child you know like minds, the 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 logic is very pure. Yeah, yeah, you know? they can see what's going on. They're not clouded by like Ugh. <laughs> by a desire, right? Which in the original, the you know the twelve year old is completely smitten. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know just come like, but yeah, yeah, because of that opening scene. Yeah, but you did take like I was surprised that like you know in terms of setting. That it seems like the tone is similar, like you know, right from the get-go, that the two movies open with a similar shot, really. Yeah, I think that they have like a war montage. Oh yeah, yeah, be, uh, so, yeah. They yeah. really establish the civil war. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, and ours, yeah, we follow her to discover him. Right. I, I can't remember in, in the original. Maybe you meet him first. No, I think she she finds him in a surprise, but. Um, I think yeah. he did a great job, like just excising the backstories that were so heavy-handed in the original that really don't allow the characters to uh, be human in a way. Yeah, right? yeah. No, I wanted them to. I wanted you to be able to relate to them, even though it's a really over-the-top situation, but have them be human underneath that. And but, the actors help with that, right? But in yours, it's not that over-the-top. It makes sense. Okay. In, you know, in the original, like once you know, you see the flashback of what really happened in the battle with him. You're like, this guy's just <laughs> shitty on all levels. Yeah, I think it's much more intriguing not to know. You know yeah, that like there's, he, right? He yeah. cops to cowardice. Yeah, you want to know if you don't know. Oh, he's bad, and they're good, and yeah. And, and that, then there's all the creepy shit. But the one scene that I there's thought, like psychedelic montage. And oh yeah, the lesbian dream. fantasy. Yeah, the, the dream sequence. Yeah. Geraldine Page's yeah. dream sequence. Yeah, I think that was just a, 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 a product of the, the, the era. The time. Yeah, yeah, or, or something Don was dealing with. <laughs> <laughs> How can I get two women to kiss? <laughs> I wish Don was around to. To defend himself? No, just to hear more. He made some good movies, right? Yeah, of course. It's interesting, though, too. After you know, you know, whatever Clint went through in those early movies, that him, he as a director is somewhat feminist, you know, in 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 his movies. Yeah, that is interesting. It's odd, right? Like the ones he made himself yeah. are very sensitive to it. Yeah. But yeah, I like also in the original, and then we're going to talk about other things. But in the original, like the um, the gore. <laughs> Was like it, they had it in there. Like I was surprised because, like in your movie, they went for it. Well, they went for it, but it was almost ridiculous. Like blood in the seventies was just this weird red paint <laughs> yeah. that was everywhere. But like when that thing happens, it happens in the movie. You're like, oh my god! Well, they tried their best. <laughs> oh, good. It, you know, at least there was. You know, but in yours, like you're like, Whoa. you know, it was very. You know, you had to do it real. Yeah, I think I was trying to make it realistic. So I, so I like the movie. It's beautiful. It was Thank shot you. beautifully. You won a big prize. Right? Yeah, and can. Yeah. You. Is that what? I, I have no idea what, you know, what can is like. I've talked to some people about it, and you've probably been there a lot with your dad and with other movies. Yeah. Yeah. Is it like, is it glamorous and exciting, or is it just a big clusterfuck, like a, like a, like a European version of South by Southwest? Like what, what? <laughs> I've never been to South by Southwest. Um, really? You elitist. <laughs> no, I just missed it. Um, yeah. I would like to. It's in Austin, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they have all different South by's yeah. now. They have the, you know, they oh, have yeah, the film, right. the television, the music. Right. It's it's a big enterprise. Yeah, I'd like to, but yeah, can is always glamorous. Yeah, I mean, especially in the in the seventies. I remember going as a kid, and because it still had like hippies and black right. tie, and it had, and I remember uh, 
Cheech and Chong up in smoke. There's a huge joint on the Quasette, and then people in tuxedos, and it was that's just a, a glamorous time. Uh, that's a childhood yeah. memory, Cheech and yeah. Chong. They make an impact, Cheech and Chong. I know my brothers, my big brothers, got to go, and I I wasn't allowed to go to Up in Smoke. <laughs> Um, it stayed with me, but, um. I had them here. Oh, yeah? Yeah, as, like, you know, after they've gone through all they've gone through, and they were sort of trying to, you know, get out in the world again. That's what so was cool. so funny, because, like, I'm wearing these headphones, and, like, I grew up listening to Cheech and Chog, is that the two of them talk like that. So, oh, wow. So when you hear them interacting with each other, you're like, oh my god, yeah. this is Cheech and Chog <laughs> record. <laughs> it's blowing your mind. <laughs> it was kind of. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, but yeah, Cam is always exciting and glamorous, and, and it's always, kind of nerve-wracking to show your movie there. It's in this beautiful big theater with a great screen in the best way, but it's nerve-wracking because they're notorious for, like, booing and being harsh. And How did it, um, like, outside of winning Best Director, how did how was it... Uh, they went how, well. They reacted well? Yeah, so that was a relief. It was exciting. It was the first time I've seen it finished and with the cast, and so it was... You know, you're there on the south of France. And yeah. It was, it was exciting. Kidman seems to be really kind of working. Like, yeah. she's out a lot. And yeah. And she's doing interesting roles. Yeah, I, I'm always impressed that she does interesting parts and supports different kinds of movies. And when I asked her to, to do this, she, you know, a day later, she said yes. It wasn't a whole process. So she was really enthusiastic. And it, it's cool to see all the different things she's doing. Yeah. I've well, always loved her as an actress. Yeah, me too. And, and like, there was this period where she wasn't around much. Yeah. And now, like, she's really kind of sinking her teeth into some real shit. I know. It's cool. Like, the Lion movie, is that what it's called? Yeah. And she was great in that. Yeah. And is she a nice person? Yes, she's really nice. She's really warm, and she's so kind of regal and tall and imposing. And so then, it's it's always a surprise that she's so warm and, um, you know. Yeah. What's your What's your relationship with your movies and your old man? Do you do, oh like do you show him? Do you ask him for advice? Yeah. Do you? This one I sh- I I showed him when I was just finishing editing. Yeah. He, so he didn't read it or didn't know. He didn't know anything about it. He's like, I don't want to know anything until I see it. And I, I was wondering what he was going to think of it. I thought, oh, God, what's he going to think? And then he watched it, and he really liked it. And he, he said, oh, Nicole's character was so brave that she had to figure out how to do that. And I was really surprised. So um, it's, always, it's always fun to... Has he always yeah. been supportive? I imagine he has. Yeah, yeah. He's always been. And, and when I was starting, he was more kind of, you know, anxious for me and trying to give advice. And now he is just into how I do things. Yeah, we, we, after you win a couple Academy Awards, he's like, no, nah, maybe she's doing all right. You got it. You got it. <laughs> no, I think your parents always worry about, about you, but, um, but no, he's sweet. He was really, he's really enthusiastic. So it helped, you know, to finish editing, knowing that it can't be that bad if he didn't, he liked it. <laughs> sure. Well, of course. And, and can you, uh, like, you know, throughout your, your filmmaking career, were, was he, I, I mean, I don't want, you know, I'm not di- diminishing anything, but I, I would have to assume, like, you know, I, you know, I asked the same question, uh, you know, to, you know, to Jacob Dylan, you know, cause you get this, oh, yeah. this idea that's sort of like, you know, that you gotta have your own life and you gotta be separate. And, and like when I asked him, it's like, uh, I said, does he, you know, it, you know, he, he, his father is the greatest songwriter ever. Yeah, so he's he like, he, asked, he mentioned lyrics. Well, yeah, he's <laughs> like, well, I have access to the greatest songwriter ever. And, you know, we have a shorthand because, yeah. you know, like there's this assumption that there's yeah, sometimes friction. I never got that with you, but early on, was he more, um, did he give advice around, you know, the actual act of directing? I remember co- him coming on set when I was doing my first movie on Virgin Suicides, and he yeah. kept saying, "You need to say action louder. They have to know you're in charge." And I was like, "Okay, Dad, like, <laughs> and, uh, let me do it my way." Um, and um, yeah, so there's always, you know, that just kind but, of parent, right? But but other than that, no mm-hmm. kind of like um, you know shooting s- stuff or story ideas, other than the third act thing that you seem to remember. Oh or- yeah, no, I mean, I always. Uh, before I do a movie, I sometimes I'll ask him just kind of refresher courses. Like on this, I'll ask about his rehearsal process because he always has a really interesting way he rehearses with that? actors and um, just to spend time with the actors before. And he does like he came from theater, so he yeah. he did a lot of theater games. And he would he said it was really important to get them together and, and have them make a meal together and yeah. make real food and eat together. And that's something that he did in The Godfather, where he had the family come together and make a meal. And it, and then he said ever since that improv that the actors just change their relationships with each other so so i've done that on film so i, I always like to talk to him about how he works with actors to, p- to prepare before the shooting i think that's really helpful yeah because like some people i get i've talked to walter hill and and I, maybe one or two other people that people are i think directors really approach that differently that like some directors 
with Walter, it was interesting because, you know, he was like, well, let me just dispel the myth that, uh, you know, the director is some sort of hands-on guide <laughs> with an actor. Because he basically said, look, you hired the person to do a job. And, yeah. the, and then they do the job. <laughs> Yeah, no, so much of it is just the casting. People are asking, like, how do you work with the actors? Right. And it's like, I cast the people I think can do it, and then I let them do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think that's some sort of weird... I, I don't know where that idea of the director kind of, like, getting in and working with... I mean, there are scenes, though, when your father, uh, you know, on on Apocalypse Now, in that documentary, that, that I think your mother shot, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I can't, and they're still together. Yeah, it's not incredible. It is sort of incredible. Yeah, they've been married for 55 years. Well, it seems like at the core of it, your dad's a pretty sweet guy. He's yeah. Got, he got a little crazy for a while. What are you going to do? He's, you know, he's an artist. <laughs> <laughs> he got ups and downs, but he's, but he's but, sweet. But that scene where he's like, I'm a, I got to deal with crazy Marlon, you know, and Dennis Hopper and Marlon Brando, so he hasn't read the book. So like yeah. I like I imagine that that thing was very hands on, but like you, yeah. you know even though you're dealing with these great actors, like you you know he had to he had almost a there's that scene that that always kills me is that John Milius you know talking about why he took a job he says like you know, uh, Francis had convinced me this would be the first film to win the Nobel Prize. Oh right. <laughs> it's so <all> good. <laughs> so you're dealing with a guy that was like a lot of hyper- passion. I guess passion is a <laughs> diplomatic word for it. But you generally just, you know, you have a meal, and you do, what do you do with that meal? Do you talk about the characters? Oh, or no, in character. They have they do oh. it in character. Oh, that's, so yeah, that's so, the improv. So, so, yeah, they're in character, and they make a meal together as a family or, or their group. And, like, for our movie, we had them in a house, you know, and, and Nicole's character was in charge of everything. And uh-huh. all the dynamics of the characters start to come out. So you do, like, it's like rehearsals, but they're more improv. And it's just you guys. There's no crew yeah. or nothing. No, it's just it's just them and, and me. And yeah. it's it's fun. We did. Yeah. Do you, you engage with them, or do you just watch? No, I try to stay out of it, or I'll whisper something to to try something. But no, it's just more for them to to wow. feel up being in the characters, and they start to wear the corsets. And that's why there's something about I never would have never thought of it, but my dad said when you have food, it becomes like sensory and sure, I don't know. it connects you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they're kind of bonded. Yeah. For that and and start to feel like the characters in this it helps to do it in a setting did you have southern food um i think they made breakfast no. <laughs> together yeah no, like biscuits and gravy or no no, no just regular not, breakfast yeah. were people eating healthy because i think that would diminish it seems like you have some actresses there that were sort of like you know maybe not Watching. bread and no <laughs> <laughs> no it wasn't too is that maybe that was wrong of me to say but i, I no, just, I, yeah I hear you. and you've done that with all your movies you did that with uh with dorf on you know on what about, oh yeah, I mean we always try to do a rehearsal period where the actors spend time together. And, and when we were doing somewhere, um, Stephen took Elle to do. He picked her up from school and took her bowling and to do things together. So that when we started filming, they had you know just kind of making a history. I think that was an interesting choice for you, you know for casting because like he's one of those guys that looked like it was going to be huge, and then he's kind of been around. I know. I think he's such a good actor. I think but, so too. But um. Yeah, I, and he was so that guy and has a lot of heart, but it's true he didn't he hasn't had as many yeah. opportunities to do his thing. Yeah, and that and that movie was sort of like heartbreaking just because of the nature of that. I I don't you yeah. know, a lot of times I talk about you know, I think that people in show business get sort of dismissed uh, by the culture in in terms of like people who aren't enamored with celebrity think that like what do you guys really do? Yeah. The, you know, which really sort of annoys me because the 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 process of making art or make or doing acting and doing direct it's like it's it's hard work yeah and i think if you if you do it well it looks easy like any like anyone that's good at what they do i think i guess so i you know i just i it, it annoys me lately <laughs> that there's this idea that you know we're we're all slacking out here oh really yeah like you know, yeah. just sort of like no you guys what are you <laughs> just actors it's like yeah yeah we're keeping you know we're we're trying to balance we're trying to have the some horror culture going exactly. out, yeah but but in ter- in that movie was that how much of that was from sort of personal experience? I mean, you know, growing up in show business and you having done some acting yourself, you know, and knowing all these actors and having them in your family, uh, y- you know, it seemed to be a, a very sympathetic and very specific you know prof- portrait of of somebody in this business, you know, yeah. which I, I I think is not easy to do necessarily. Yeah, I just, I feel like spending time with Chateau Ramon, I've seen those guys. There's a lot of, it was, he was a mix of a lot of different actors and, and But you story. never hung out there? 
I did it in the 90s. I yeah, did. Right. I did. Yeah. And, um, and yes, yeah, so it was a lot based on, but yeah, I knew people like that. And I wrote it right after I had my first daughter, so I was thinking about kind of the idea of being a parent. And, and you'd already uh, been divorced yeah. once. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my 20s. Yeah. Yeah. So I, luckily I didn't have kids that round. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, so this I was thinking about, I just had a baby and I was thinking about, I don't know, being a parent and then those, and, and just knowing kind of guys like that. And, sure. And then there's, of course, part of my dad. The character's not like my dad at all, but just the when they go to Italy, I've had trips like that with my dad with lots of ice cream. and Yeah, just, you know. yeah. It's sweet. Yeah. Okay. But, but like, played up against the sort of, like, I, I don't know, the, the men, like, e- like, even with, you know, the Bill Murray character in Lost in Translation, it's like, to be lost. Yeah. And, but yet see to that. Be, huh? I don't know you see that in certain people. Oh, no, definitely. Yeah. But, you know, but, but also to be so, you know, like people know of you or they know who, you know, they, it's, it's a strange thing to have a public personality. Yeah. And yet, you know, behind it, there's just this melancholy or existential kind of like despair. Yeah. I've, I don't know. I've seen that in I, yeah. people. Yeah. You, I think it happens in all occupations. Yeah. But, you know, the public face is sort of like this strange thing that you have to, you kind of have to be that guy. Yeah, yeah. People and then, want you to be. Yeah. Well, now working with those two, with with Scarlett at that point in her career, and with uh, with Bill, did you do the improvisations with them? I don't think we did. I think um, Bill, sh- they both showed up in t- in Tokyo, and we just were winging it. But the, but the characters didn't know each other, so it was okay. I think it's more in films where the characters are supposed to have a history together. Right, right. And that one, they didn't know each other, so we all kind of just showed up in Tokyo and yeah. and hit the ground running. And that was like you got him at a good point. Like he's such a, a like an amazing talent of some kind. Of, like, I know. What I was, a trip. I know. I was so happy when he showed up, and yeah. and and I love when he sings. Like to give him a microphone. We we, we actually all went to karaoke. That was fun. To, oh, you did? Yeah. Well, on on some downtime. Yeah, when we were prepping, it was fun. <laughs> yeah, but it's um it's always fun to be around Bill Murray. I, it is right. And he's touring right now with the. Have you heard about his music tour that he's doing? I didn't. He's um, yeah. I don't know what they're called, but he's he has a like a four piece classical music group, and he's singing like Van Morrison songs. Oh really? Yeah, I heard one song and it was really touching. Yeah, well he like, has a lot he, of heart. Well, that's the thing. He's you know, a, and a heavy heart. Somehow. Yeah, yeah. Do, you know, like it's a it's it's very interesting that what that that part of him that he's able to put out there, you know, if cast right and just in general, that you know, I I don't know what the word is, but but lovable. The, <laughs> well, I guess it is lovable. Okay, Groundhog Day. He said when he's downtrodden. And, yeah. And, you know, there's something lovable. About yeah, him. yeah, yeah. Like he just can't get a leg up <laughs> in a way, and and he's immediately sympathetic somehow. Even, yeah. Even when he's playing, you know, he doesn't really play assholes that often. No. But Scrooge, maybe. Scrooge, yeah. and also that one with Melissa McCarthy. But the, oh, that yeah. guy had a lot of heart too. And he yeah, he always that, has heart. It comes well, I think to. so. Right. I think that's a, the trick with him is like no matter how much of an asshole he may be, there's that that thing he has. Yeah. What? How did you? Direct that that Christmas special. How did that happen? Oh, how did that come apart? I think I was um, I was I love when Bill sings, and I was saying, oh, I wish you would just do a week at the at the Carlisle singing old standards. I'd just love to see Bill singing, um, you know, Chet Baker, classics. right? Yeah, yeah. And um, and then our friend Mitch Glazer, who's a writer that is works with Bill a lot, they were talking about doing some kind of show, and and we thought, oh, can we incorporate the music into that and. We thought, oh, maybe we'll do a Valentine's special, and I know somehow it turned into a Christmas special. But but Bill and Mitch were talking about doing a some kind of a TV thing, and yeah, and that's how and that, <laughs> that all, that's we how it, put came it all about. came together. So, um, what happens now? The, you're going to have a big premiere tonight. Yeah, our movie. We have our premiere tonight, and then it comes out this weekend. It's exciting. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. We shot it last fall in New Orleans, so it's it's been we just now the premiere. It. Does the whole family go? Um, no, my, my parents are in Europe. They're not around, but hmm. I have a lot of cousins that are coming. <laughs> Is Nicolas Cage coming? Oh, uh, I wish. He, he's living in Las Vegas. I invited him, but I don't think he's here. Do you, like, I, like, I always wanted to think that you guys are all in touch a lot. I just saw him. I was in Las Vegas for something for the movie, and yeah. he took me out. He took me and Kirsten out in a stretch limo, and we, we went to a show, and it was really fun. Yeah? <laughs> he's a character, huh? Yeah, he's really fun. <laughs> And Jason, like he's got a kid now, and you guys—he has three and three. Yeah, and our, when did that happen? Uh, I know. When was there a new one? Yeah, there's a little boy now. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's cute. And um, yeah, my 
daughter and his daughter are close in age and they're pals. So when it's been a while since the last movie, you, you do spend time between movies, huh? Yeah, it takes me a while because I write the script and um, and I never really know what I'm doing when I finish a movie. It takes a moment to figure out what I want to do next and then I, I write the script. And By the time you get it together, it takes a few years. And I try you, to have a life in between. Too. You do? Well, you have kids. Yeah, and I have two you, kids. And you have, you're in New York and yeah. you're married to a musician. Yeah. It's, and, and, you know, there's, there's life to be had. Do yeah. you go see music? Do you do what do you do? Um, as a grown-up. I don't know what I to do as a grown-up. Do you? Do I you don't just, know. It's all a blur. <laughs> I feel like... Like dinner with people and what... You know what yeah. I mean? I imagine kids make it a little more, like, immediate yeah. kid stuff. Yeah, but I... I don't know. We hang out with friends. And yeah. Because I was just in New York, and I just, like... I decided I needed to go to Lincoln Center and see jazz, and you can just do that there. Uh, I have to do that more living in New York. I, I, I don't do it. And now I'm, like... I'm at this age where I'm, like, am I missing something? Because, like, I don't know. Life is pretty fulfilling. <laughs> But there seems to be these things that are supposed to be really amazing. And did you enjoy it? Yeah, I loved it. Are you yeah. kidding? It's like a, you know, a bunch of dudes with horns up there. I know. And I have then, to do that. I feel like New York has so many, just always something going on like that. And you, like your grandfather was a composer, right? Yeah, yeah. Did you, like, do you have memories of that? Like, um, had that being important? Yeah, I mean, I went and saw him uh, conducting, he did the, the performance in front of Napoleon. Napoleon. I yeah. saw that when I was in college. Really? Yeah, it was like a big deal. Yeah, you're, you're it was d- at that that era because I saw it at the I saw it at the um, Colosseum in Rome and right. Yeah. Your dad put it together, right? Yeah. You know, he re-edited it in, in a triptych. I, I remember think, it was a big yeah. deal. Yeah, they I guess they um, preserved it. Or, Abel Gantz's yeah Napoleon. Yeah, I remember it became red, white, and blue. At yeah, one point. yeah. It was a black, live French orchestra black. conducted by Carmine Coppola. Yeah, I don't know how that came about. Uh, yeah, I remember classes. seeing it like, wow, cool. it was a silent movie oh. and there was a whole orchestra. Yeah. And I think he did Koyaanisqatsi. Didn't he produce that too or no? Yeah, yeah, his company. Um, and they're I still guess. a company. They do your movie sometimes? American Zoetrope, yeah. What else do they do? Do, what's a, do you have, uh, are you? Um, they, you know, not so many other projects, but we always have little things going. And um, Do you I, remember the time we directed a musical? That oh, my dad, a, One from the Heart. And they showed it at Radio City, I remember. Right. Yeah, that was a, I love that movie, the style of it. So yeah, I remember yeah. they were shooting it. They, yeah, they so rebuilt Las Vegas in a soundstage that's right, right, here in Hollywood. Right. And yeah. I remember that, that at the time, he's like, I have this amazing technology where you can watch the take yeah. right after on video. Yeah, it was digital. It was like the first time. That was... They, uh, they sh- Oh, what was his? What's the lead in that? Uh, 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 Terry Gar and Freddie Forrest. Freddie and I, Forrest. It has the best. I love that soundtrack album. It's great with Tom yeah. Waits, Tom Crystal Waits Gale. Yeah, I, love, I have that. Yeah, it's a great. Um, it's a great I, It's record. great just to listen to that soundtrack. Were you on yeah. set for that? Yeah, I was. I was roller skating around the lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. What happened to Fred Forrest? I haven't seen him in a long time. I don't. I don't know. He's a good actor. Yeah, he's great. All right, so you, uh, do you have anything else in mind in terms of like what you're going to do next? I know uh, you're in the middle yeah. of this thing. No, I'm just excited for this to come out and uh, summer vacation. I think it's amazing. Who was the uh, DP on it? Oh, he's so great. Philippe Lesord. He's a Frenchman. It's good to have a French cinematographer. Yeah, man, all that like mist and the, the, what kind of trees are those? Uh, they're big oak trees with, with uh, the, Spanish moss, and yeah, um, yeah. and he had a lot of like smoke machines going. We shot on thirty-five millimeter film, which was exciting. But that's all and, shot on thirty-five. Yeah, yeah. Huh. And I hope people see it in the theater because I think it's. I should. I need to see it in the theater. Yeah, come to, I, you can come tonight or this week. We're, yeah? we're showing it. You've shown it a few times. Yeah, it's always going to be at the New Beverly with a double feature with the Don Siegel movie. It is. Yeah. When? Uh, Wednesday. Like Quentin Tarantino is hosting. Oh, uh, can I get into that? Yeah, of course. Is it all sold out? Um, I'm sure I can get you. I'm sure I have a ticket. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can pull, that's on Wednesday? Yeah. Double yeah, feature. Double feature. Because I want to see the Don Siegel movie in the theater. Oh, my God. Yeah, come. I'll, I'll find out what time. We'll set it up. <laughs> well, I think you did a great job. Thank you. It's and it was great to talking you. to you. It's exciting mm-hmm. to meet you too. Do you think we covered it? Uh, I think so. <laughs> yeah, we got it all for, uh, for most of it. Where'd you shoot this thing? Uh, in New Orleans. Oh. Uh, it almost looks like the same house from the Don Siegel movie. Oh, yeah, I loved, we couldn't get that house, but... Um, you tried? I, I, I tried to figure it out, but it's been restored. But we shot at an old plantation um, outside of town, and then we shot in New Orleans. The how, interior. How long were you down there? We were there from um, October to early December. And how was that experience? Mm-hmm. Have you been there before? 
I've only been there for, you know, a couple of days at a time. I went to Jazz Fest before, but I've never spent time there. I love New Orleans. Everyone's so nice there and, it's and nice. good it's, food. And It's another one of those cities where you're like, it's got, you know, you, right when you get there, you're like, this is its own place. Yeah, yeah. there's nowhere else like it. It's, right. It's so distinct, the way it looks and the feeling. It's kind of it. a weird, magical thing. It is. I love it, I think. And it was fun to come with kids, too. And I thought it'd just be like... You know, drunk people with plastic cups. We, we stayed in the French Quarter. Yeah, but um, but it was really fun, and and everyone there is really friendly. And do you bring your family on set with you, like your dad did? They came to visit, but they stayed in school in New York. But they came over like Thanksgiving. So your dad would just take you out of school. And, yeah, and I can't just... multiply. I never <laughs> learned how to multiply. It's really pathetic. Yeah, we just would leave school, and um, it was fun. That was always fun to go on location. And to go to school wherever you were. Yeah, I went to like just the local school wherever. That's wild. so wild. He, I guess family was always that's more that was the priority. Was very important to him. Yeah. Do you think it was like you you know uh, all in uh, like re- was it because he liked having the family together or he needed to have you guys there? Oh, I think it's yeah. <laughs> it's, I never thought about that. I think it's the Italian thing of keeping the family together. But he told me, and I don't remember when he was in Cannes for Apocalypse. Now there's a. There's a you can see footage of um, his press conference and, he, and I'm on his lap and he said I I just thought that they'd be um, you know less harsh to him if I had a, a kid on my a lap shield. yeah so I was like thanks so. <laughs> and were they I, I don't know how it went if the, how hard a time they gave him I think it went well I don't know but it was you know yeah. a little close to the Vietnam War time to be That's, making something about that oh uh, yeah and it just seemed like like it seems like he's relaxed you know since that movie certainly since oh yes yes. I mean, like, it must have been a process. I can't... <laughs> yeah. No, he's he's more mellow now. And he likes wine. Yeah. All right. Well, it was good talking to you, Sophia. Thank you. Awesome. I very much enjoyed meeting Sophia Coppola and talking to her. Very nice and very amazingly uh, talented. And I love the new movie, The Beguiled. All right? Okay, and don't forget to check out One Night Only with Alec Baldwin, whether you know him from 30 Rock or as the guy who has hosted SNL a record 17 times or as the guy who does Trump better than Trump himself. Let's face it, Alec Baldwin is a guy who loves to dish it out, but now it's his turn to take it. When he and his friends hit the stage for an all-star comedy tribute, One Night Only with Alec Baldwin premieres Sunday, July 9th at 9 on Spike. All right, go to WTFPod.com for all that. Get on the mailing list. I can't play guitar. It's, it's hot in here. I haven't showered since I got off the plane. So I stink. I haven't changed. I have to decide what I'm going to wear to the premiere tonight of Glow. That's right. Going to a premiere. Got to wear something. Maybe they're going to take some pictures of me. Who thought this shit was going to happen to me? I'll tell you who didn't. Me. Boomer lives! It. I watched it, I went to a screener and watched it, and then I went to a, a little premiere thing that uh, Sophia spoke at at Quentin Tarantino's theater, the New Beverly, and they ran it back to back with the original Beguiled. Now the original, like it was interesting for me to watch the original because I watched Sophia's first, and then I watched the original before I talked to her. And the original is a menacing, macabre, uh, Southern Gothic. I would almost call it a horror story. And the new one, it's different. It it is the same story, but it's 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 approached very differently. Um, there are elements. For, she went back and found the book. I talked to her about that. But it, you know, as far as what she drew from the original movie, which is a Don Siegel film, Clint Eastwood's in it, Geraldine Page is in it, and it's really against character for uh, for old Clint. I don't know. I, maybe this is either just before or just after uh, Dirty Harry. Maybe it was um, shooting almost simultaneously, it seemed. But it was before Clint had... A certain angle, and and right at the beginning of the beguiled in the Clint Eastwood version, the Don Siegel version, you know he's uh, just a, sh- a shitty man, just like, and it just gets weirder and weirder with all the the effects and uh, psycho weirdness from the seventies cinema, 
you know, er- everything is just loaded and it's in the South. The, the story is about a, a Union soldier who is injured and, you know, stumbles upon a little girl picking mushrooms and is taken in at this uh, small girl's school. Most of the girls are gone, but there's a few there. And right from the get-go in the Siegel version, it's menacing from all levels and all the characters are a bit fucked up. But in Sophia's, there's a, a beautiful kind of poetic feel to it. There's a, a lyrical vibe to it. It's all, the camera work is all handled beautifully. It was shot in New Orleans and Col- Colin Farrell plays the Union soldier, but you don't know a, a, what to do with him from the beginning. Obviously the situation is loaded, uh, when a soldier is taken in by a girls school with the women from all ages present and you don't know what's going to happen. Or how it's going to go. But uh, if you've seen the original, you've got a, somewhat of an idea. But I wouldn't uh, judge, you, you know, don't don't go into the new one thinking that you know what's going to happen uh, in a, and about other things. But uh, I did want to share this email right out of the gate. It just says in the subject line, just want to say thanks. Mark, after years of your promos, I've recently, finally subscribed to Stitcher Premium to get access to your back catalog. Why did I wait? I've forgotten how good some of these are. The hour with Patrice O'Neill is life-changing. The perspective I have now on episodes with folks like Jimmy Fallon or Brian Cranston makes them all the more fascinating. You've been a big part of my life now for almost a decade. Listening to these back apps is like looking at an old photo album. Hearing the whole intro, hearing you speak of Boomer in the present tense, hearing you rant about various romantic interests you had at that moment, it's all great. Feel free to use this as a testimonial in any advertising you wish. I'd be flattered. And thanks again for the laughs, the tears, and the twice-weekly dose of sanity. Love you, brother, Dan. Well, Dan, it just so happens that that fits right into me telling people, yesterday we posted an episode of the new podcast miniseries Classic Showbiz with Cliff Nesteroff. Go check it out. And if you want to hear more, more of those or any of the stuff I just talked about, you can get it on Howl or the new Stitcher Premium Service. That's the whole damn shebang, the whole WTF catalog, all there. But the uh, classic showbiz stuff is great. Pow, look out. I just shit my pants, just coffee.coop. That's a classic style ad from the old days of WTF. I'm actually not even drinking uh, just coffee. I'm drinking some uh, chicory coffee uh, out of a mug that is uh, the type that they have in uh, diners. Some people use them for promotional mugs, but they're a very specific type of mug. None of this matters. None of it matters. I got a mug from Stephen Colbert. Holy shit. The swag in the dressing room at the Colbert show is a, a, a bit beyond. Just, you walk in, it's like there might as well be a fucking Christmas tree in there. There was all kinds of shit. There was cheese that you could eat right there. Nice sort of uh, artisanal cheese with a baguette and crackers. There was uh, products from Lush. That uh, healthy manufacturer of giant balls that you drop in the tub and bubble. There was all kinds. Of, there was some. There was some uh, socks. There was the the mug. There was a T-shirt. There was like a bunch of different cakes and cookies and shit. Man, by the time I got done with Colbert, I was like I, I was in a sugar coma. So that being said, that I was there. It was. In- Folks, many of you know him as Jack Donahue, the ruthless king of one-liners on 30 Rock, or as the guy who has hosted SNL a record 17 times, or as the guy who does Trump better than Trump himself. Alec Baldwin is being honored with an all-star comedy tribute called One Night Only on Spike. It's Alec Baldwin, you know, coffee is for closers and Beetlejuice's nemesis and the very first Jack Ryan. Let's face it, folks, Alec Baldwin is a guy who loves to dish it out, but now it is his turn to take it. When he and his friends hit the stage for an all-star comedy tribute, One Night Only with Alec Baldwin, premieres Sunday, July 9th at 9 on Spike. Also, I want to let you know about something cool. You heard me talk about going to see some great jazz recently, and I just found out about this not-for-profit arts organization called Jazz Reach. It's dedicated to the promotion, performance, teaching, and creation of jazz music and is the nation's leading provider of live educational jazz programming on the subject. Jazz Reach presents more than 50 educational performances in numerous clinics, master classes, lecture demonstrations, and main stage concerts every year. If you want to learn more or donate, go to Jazz Reach. 
jazzreach.org. The arts are important, so go help out, will ya? That's jazzreach.org. All right, let's do the show. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuck sticks? Uh, what the fuck nicks? How are you? What's happening? My name is Mark Marin. This is WTF, my podcast. Nice to have you. Today on the show, I will be talking to Sophia Coppola, which is very exciting because I enjoyed her new movie, uh, The Beguiled, very much. And I've, I've liked almost all of her movies. Why not just say all of them? Why not be diplomatic, Mark? Well, to be honest, I haven't seen one of them. All right, but I've seen the other ones that I saw, I like. There's no reason to assume that I wouldn't like the other one. But this one was pretty beautiful and pretty challenging in a good way and, uh, and, and kind of amazing because it, it forced me to go watch the original, which I believe I had seen at some point in my life. It would be hard to imagine forgetting that film. But I think maybe it was one of those films that I never saw in its entirety, but only saw parts of. The original Beguiled, uh, I believe it was shot by, was it Don Siegel in the early 70s? Same guy did Dirty Harry with Clint Eastwood. Anyways, I'll look it up and, and talk to you about it in a minute. Who started out in roughly the same hallway, in a way, in television, I believe we started out next to each other, you know, with, all, with a, almost practically adjoining offices. So I was sort of happy and proud of him and and excited to be there because we're contemporaries and he's driving the big ship. He's driving the big theater. He's driving the Ed Sullivan Theater and that's a that's no that's a heavy legacy, man. And Stephen was great. It was great to see him. And I think we worked well together. I don't know, you know, I've had an opportunity to build relationships with, you know, with Conan uh, a bit with Letterman, and this is the first time I've done his talk show and it is a very specific thing to do a talk show segment. Uh, panel segment. And I, and I think we did good. I think we both had a good time and I think it went well. Feeling each other out on the stage at the Ed Sullivan Theater. So if you didn't see that, you can go watch that now. I was there to, uh, to promote Glow. And it just so happens we're sponsored today by Netflix. And what's premiering on Netflix tomorrow? That's right. It's finally time for Glow, the show you've been hearing me talk about for months. It's the story of the first all-female wrestling league from the 1980s, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. Oh, man, I can't wait. It's it's happening. People are loving it. I mean, I, and I, look, I, you know, I don't want to, I'm not toot my own horn. I'm very happy for everybody involved, but the, the reviews for it have been amazing. It's from the team that brought you Orange is the New Black. That's executive producer Jen G. Cohen and the creators are Liz Flayhive and Carly Mensch. Check it out, not just for me, but for my great co-stars, Allison Bree, Betty Gilpin, and everyone else in the cast. There's another 12 of them. And I'll have more WTF episodes coming up with people from GLOW, Genji Cohen, Kia Stevens, Chavo Guerrero, the showrunners, and the writing staff. All episodes of GLOW are streaming tomorrow, Friday, June 23rd, only on Netflix. Well, it's exciting. I, You know, I, I hope it gets out. You know, we're constantly on uh, End of the World Watch, so I'm checking my phone. I, I like it if the world didn't end before GLOW premieres. Is that selfish? Is that self-centered? I'd like the missiles to not fly at all, but you know, hopefully in, until after Friday. Give give people a week to watch Glow. Could you do that, Mr. President? So Sophia Coppola is here, and the beguiled man. This like I actually her new film. I uh, I watched twice, and I watched it twice in a the theater actually. So I saw it the way you're supposed to see. Interesting, you know. I did the Today Show. Uh, which I've done before with, uh, with Al Roker. My old, uh, co, most guest appearances on Conan, uh, guy. We were the go-tos back in the day, me and Roker. They had a guest fall out when they were in New York. They'd give us a call. What do you got, Marin? Got anything? Got any half-done jokes that could find themselves as you chat to Conan? I do. Bring me in. But, uh, the Today Show was fun. I did that with Allison and, uh, Betty Gilpin. And then I did a bunch of serious shows over on Sirius. Uh, I did uh, Bill Carter's show. I did Jimmy Norton's show. I did the Entertainment Weekly show. I did a little thing for their new Beatles channel. And then uh, I had uh, I had uh, lunch at Alex Guarnicelli's restaurant. Butter. Guys, I'm just free plug day. I'm just trying to walk you through my day in New York. It was just nearby, and fuck, it was good. 
She was an heir, though. I texted her. She was, uh, you know, at a benefit of some kind. I love her. I love her cooking. That's, that's, uh, that's all I'm going to say on that. But then the exciting thing, though, was I'd never done the Colbert show since he's been there. Uh, I've never done any of his shows. I'd been on Letterman a few times, but I'd never done Steven's show. And I've never really interviewed Steven on this show. But I was excited to do his show because, you know, he's getting the hang of it. And he's a, he's a very talented guy and he's a very sweet man, Mr. Colbert. And I've always felt that from way back in the day. We knew each other, uh, a bit way back in the day. And I talked about it on my appearance on the Colbert show. Well, he brought it up, but we used to work next door to each other in an office back in 93, 94. He was in Exit 57. I was hosting Short Attention Span Theater. And he was always a very grounded, uh, kind of almost clean cut fella. But the thing that was exciting about going back to the Ed Sullivan Theater for uh, the uh, Late Show with Stephen Colbert is that, as I said, I'd been there before. Letterman, obviously, was a big part of my life. And I love David Letterman. I always was more than honored to do the David Letterman show. But this was going to that theater and and doing a show that is hosted by a contemporary of mine, someone around my age, someone uh, who came up with me, at the same time, we not together, but we were, you know, chipping away at show business at the same time. He arguably was a lot more present and you knew him a lot better than me, but it, it was just kind of fascinating that we're a couple of middle-aged guys 